Thank you very much, Dr. Garibov. Thanks for getting me here. Thank you, Dr. Mamadov as well, and Dirganira. Really nice to be with you, with you excellencies and old friends, so many of them here. I've never seen this room this full, except maybe for the oil and gas show. So uh, testimonial to Sam that uh, so many people now want to uh, think, think strategically, uh, get beyond the, the business chores that are really my daily life. Now, I'm actually very involved in business now and in the energy sector uh, and environmental sector in Turkey. So thank you for giving so much time of your day uh, to be with us. Um, so much has been said in a systematic and comprehensive way by my predecessors. Uh, like Dennis was saying, I'm very glad that I can speak uh, yeah, freely, free from really any institutional concerns. Sure, I'm a member of some think tanks, but uh, I'd like to spend some time reflecting on yeah, U.S. foreign policy in this region in general, uh, maybe dispel some myths or some, some conventional wisdom about U.S. foreign policy. Some of you won't believe it, but I'm, I'm just going to tell you what I believe, what my experience uh, had been for 23 years uh, in the middle of U.S. foreign policy uh, with regard to this part of the world. And uh, Dr. Sushentsov, you inspired me uh, with your remarks in terms of your focus on planning and your, your point that one of the functions of the state, at least in terms of foreign policy, is to plan. And that is, I know that's true of Russia, and it's so untrue of the United States very often, and to, to the United States, tremendous fault. Um, in my experience, Russian diplomats like Ambassador Dorokhin have been among the most capable, uh, knowledgeable, and strategic thinkers that I've ever encountered uh, anywhere. And, and I can't say that about uh, my colleagues uh, from the State Department. I mean, there are so many brilliant people, uh, people who are very committed to whatever issues they're focusing on for a certain number of years. They become experts on those issues but then the way the State Department system is structured, they go away. They go follow some other issue for a while. Maybe they'll come back to, to the previous issues at some point in their career. Maybe they won't. So U.S. foreign policy actually uh, does not have the degree of planning that's necessary and that other countries do have, certainly that Russia has. Um, in fact, <laughs> I recall every, every year in the State Department, we would go through this uh, obligatory planning and we hated it. We, we thought this is worthless. How can you possibly predict what the future is going to look like in 10 years or five years? Shouldn't we just focus, we would think, on the core values that we believe structure American foreign policy and then do what American foreign policy really is, which is an attempt to resolve discrete individual problems, get rid of those problems, and then move on to the next set of problems, always hoping to do a few a few grand things, sort of in line with the five principles that Andrei was just talking about in Russia's case. So the constants, the consistent factors in American foreign policy, we, or at least the way we like to think about our foreign policy, uh, are interest in political stability and security, which essentially means an absence of violence, whether it be terrorism or warfare. So we like peacefulness and predictability and stability as much as that's achievable in this very complex world. Second set of issues, uh, which is directly related, is prosperity, uh, so economic prosperity, trade, usually free trade, although currently in the United States there's a very strange debate going on, led by the president, about free trade or not free trade. Uh, of course, access to energy, not control of energy resources, though from the U.S. government's perspective, but making sure all international companies, U.S. and others, have access to the resources and that those resources can make it to market so they can reach markets without interference, either geopolitical interference or geographic interference, geographic choke points like the Turkish Straits or the Straits of Hormuz. I, I know many people in this room probably think that that's not true, that uh, of course the American government wants to control energy resources. The war in Iraq was all about controlling energy. Uh, news for you, U.S. energy companies don't want the U.S. government interfering in their quest to define their own interests to reach their own partnerships uh, with, with countries, with governments, and with, with other companies all around the world. Take Secretary of State Tillerson, for example. I, I got to know him when uh, we in the then Clinton administration were working so actively in Baku Tbilisi Jehan. He hated it. He was totally against us uh, working on that project. His people at Exxon would sometimes even raise their voices with myself, with my bosses, and tell us, you know, what business do you have interfering in the decisions that companies make? 
Uh, we would say, well, we think we're actually going to help you in the long run because there's a great liability in the Turkish Straits if something happens and the Turks use whatever legal authorities they have or don't have <laughs> to cut off the flow of oil from the Caspian Sea, you'll be in trouble. Wouldn't it be better to work this through collaboratively? So that's ultimately what happened. But what I'm trying to say is Secretary Tillerson, obviously now Secretary of State, when he was in the corporate sector, didn't want the U.S. government involved at all in Exxon's business, except when they needed us, for example, when there were problems on, in Sakhalin, uh, in Russia's Far East. So access to energy and making sure energy can make its way to, uh, to global markets, that, yes, that is a core enduring U.S. foreign policy interest, even if controlling the energy flows is not. And then finally, the third enduring set of U.S. interests uh, is the humanitarian side or human side. So of course, human rights, democracy, everything Dennis was talking about uh, also in the EU case. Um, but there's a fundamental belief uh, that everybody does better when people can make their own choices as much as possible and when there's a maximal amount of political and economic freedom. We don't always live by that, I know, in the United States, no country does, but these are the general principles that drive the thinking of the practitioners of foreign policy in the United States. So what happens then is we have debates inside the various parts of the U.S. government. Um, we don't have a clear strategy. We don't have a clear plan. We have a general sense of where we'd like the world to go. And then we figure out what are the problems that we need to work on for any given period of time. And then the debates ensue. And the, the, where the decisions are taken is at a, a grouping called the deputies committee. So the deputy ministers meet three, four, five, eight times a week, maybe sometimes twice a day, uh, in the White House, in the Situation Room. And the, bu the bureaucracy's job is to get ready for those meetings, uh, work through what the positions are of each ministry, um, prepare the, the person that's going to be at the table. Then there's often an argument or discussion the deputy national security advisor, or, or at the next level, the principals committee meeting for the, for the top level issues, the national security advisor chairs the meeting. Hopefully, the decisions are worked out. If not, ultimately, then the president has to uh, make a decision. So it's a messy process. Um, and it, it really doesn't fit well with any plan because it's competitive. And if uh, on any given day, you lose the argument, it may be difficult to bring the position back to what you maybe would have wanted in your ministry. So we do a great job when we have strong leadership, when we have clarity of leadership by the president who says, this is where we need a plan. Organize it, come back to me, and I want to see it implemented. Then we do get things done. And the one Example of that in my personal career was Baku Tbilisi Jehan and the Baku Tbilisi Erzurum natural gas pipeline. Uh, it was President Clinton, to his credit, who said, okay, we've got all of these interests uh, that revolve around Caspian energy. None of them really directly vital for the United States, right? We're, the United States has never been active in the Caspian region. Yes, sure, we have a, a couple of oil companies, but uh, uh, never has had a strategic real interest here. Our interests in the Caspian region are derivative of what I was talking about before, the, especially the desire to make sure energy can make it to the market unhindered, that there's political stability, and that people or countries are free as much as possible to choose their own destiny. So the planning process for Baku Tbilisi Jehan aimed to do what? To make sure, first and foremost, that the goals of Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Turkey, our ally, NATO ally, and friends, were met. What was the goal? It was Haider Aliyev, Edward Shevardnadze, Suleiman Demirel, who came up with a vision of the east-west corridor, uh, this one pipeline, Baku Tbilisi Jehan, that would keep Azerbaijan happy by getting its oil uh, freely to market around Armenia. Obviously, that was a strong Azerbaijani desire. Georgia wanted to feel safe, wanted to feel connected to Azerbaijan and its wealth and to Turkey and NATO that way. Turkey wanted to be significant and wanted and wants to develop itself as an energy transit hub and, and also wanted to make sure there was a minimal amount or, or, or not more oil year after year flowing through the Turkish Straits. So Baku Tbilisi Jehan made sense. But of course, there's the Russia angle. And there was a fierce debate in Washington in those years, the mid-1990s, the later 1990s, about 
what do we do with the Russia case? We know Russia wants to maximize the flow of oil and natural gas from the Caspian across its territory. Our, our Russian friends told us that all the time. Uh, Ambassador Kaluzhny, who was a Caspian envoy for, uh, for Russia uh, in the early 2000s, late 1990s, said publicly and privately to me forever, as long as I knew him, that that's our goal. It's our interest in Russia to maximize the flow of hydrocarbons from the Caspian Sea through our pipelines across our territory. Okay, fine, we accept that. So the US debate came out to be that we would support five pipelines, right? Two of them, Transit Russia, Baku Novorossiysk, uh, and then the CPC pipeline from Kazakhstan to Novorossiysk. Three didn't, the South Caucasus gas pipeline, the Baku Supsa oil pipeline, and Baku Tbilisi Jehan. So we thought we'd come up with a, a mix that could sort of satisfy everybody, all the competing factions in Washington, some of which were very much pro-Russian and always have been. There's a strong pro-Russian lobby in the US government. There's a strong anti-Russian lobby in the US government, usually centered around the Pentagon, but not only. Uh, but somehow we found a balance, we thought. Uh, and I think the policy has been really successful. It would have been impossible, though, to strike that balance without strong presidential leadership. So I'll, I'll begin to close my remarks by then bringing it to today, and maybe to Nagorno-Karabakh then. We have no foreign policy leadership in the United States right now for a couple of reasons. One, President Trump himself has no foreign policy experience, has no vision. He was surprised he won. We were surprised that Trump won. He was surprised that he won. If you go back, he even said it, I, I have a video on my phone right here. Uh, it was taken at a private event, but it's Donald Trump saying, you know, I, I got into the race because it seemed like a fun thing to do. And there were 16 other people who were running for president. And I thought I'd be around just for a few weeks. And oh my God, I went through the first month and then some dropped out. And then a few more months, more and more dropped out. And I looked at my wife and I said, these are such capable people. How can I be up here? And we decided to keep going, and wow, somehow I won. Incredible. And if, if you go and look at look in his eyes and Melania Trump's eyes the, the night of the election, when they're, they're walking down to the stage, when they just found out, they, they look terrified. So he, does, he didn't expect to win. He had no foreign policy plan, has no vision. Uh, he has a couple of ideas that bounce around in his head, and you read on Twitter, you know, terrorism is bad, and we should stop it, and... Uh, we should work together with Russia. Um, we should uh, have free trade, but not too free. We should build a wall, but no, maybe we won't. Uh, I mean, you know, with Mexico. Um, there's no consistency. He, there should be peace in the Middle East, uh, but then he goes to Saudi Arabia and then takes credit for the crisis to isolate Qatar. So there's, and there's not going to be any consistency. It's not going to happen. Uh, and the relationship between the U.S. and Russia is, is now poisoned, not because of anything you know, specifically that Russia or the U.S. did, but because of all the investigations now, the, the, the belief now uh, that, that President Trump may have been obstructing the judicial process uh, in, with regard to the investigations into whether his campaign uh, officials were doing anything improper with, with Russian colleagues. So I think um, he's going to be stuck in foreign policy for a while, and that, that's terrible. That's terrible for, for everyone, because I think we really do need the United States uh, to continue to lead in the, what we call the liberal democratic order, or it's going to go, it risks going away. But we really need the U.S. to lead here in the South Caucasus, and frankly, on Nagorno-Karabakh together with Russia. So my last remarks on Karabakh. Uh, it's, it's conventional wisdom to say that uh, nothing's happened over all these 20 plus years in Nagorno-Karabakh settlement. There's no progress. That's simply untrue. Ten years ago, right, the so-called Madrid document was agreed in principle. The basic principles were agreed in principle uh, by the presidents of Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, it's a, the only workable solution that I can think of having spent years and years thinking through this, this problem because it really does create a balance between the fundamental OSCE principles of the territorial integrity of states and the self-determination of peoples, as well as the non-use of force. The problem is neither President Aliyev or President Sarkisian trusts his counterpart, meaning not that necessarily he believes the counterpart is dishonest, but because he believes his counterpart doesn't have the, the, the strength or the courage to go out to the public and sell 
the basic principles, which will not be popular in either country. And they, the set of basic principles requires difficult compromises that, again, are, are not popular. I mean, we kind of field tested what had been brought together in principle. Uh, and uh, I, I've never heard any audience in either Armenia or Azerbaijan say, oh, we like this. It's, uh, always find big problems with the compromises one side or the other has to make. So the only way, the only way this could ever work is not to get much better mediators than the other people who've been mediating. It's to get the leadership, the presidents, eventually, of Russia and the United States with strong EU support, sure French support, but the more the EU plays, the better in this process. To provide the political umbrella or the political protection for the presidents of Azerbaijan and Armenia to finalize these basic principles and announce them. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, unlikely that Donald Trump is going to do that, but he might. If once we get out of this period of all of the uh, investigations and this very negative attitude toward Russia uh, in Washington right now, um, I, I think Nagorno-Karabakh ought to be one of the first issues that Russia and the United States come together on. Uh, I had an incredibly contentious relationship with my Russian counterparts on Georgia and an unbelievably close one on the Nagorno-Karabakh process. And even during 2008, August, when I, I was sent to Georgia by the Secretary of State, she, she said, go there and just do something. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Um, I mean, a horrible situation where I thought I was actually maybe going to be on the wrong end of some, some shooting from the Russian side. And a week later, I'm together with my, my counterpart, Ambassador Yuri Mezlakov, and we're strategizing here and in Yerevan on Nagorno-Karabakh, and it worked great. It was as if none of that other stuff mattered. So there's great potential for Russia and the US to come together with the EU and with France, of course, to provide the political cover and therefore courage the presidents need to finalize the basic principles. Um, but it's going to take some time, again, for Donald Trump to, to focus on this part of the world. We don't even have the people in place in the US government, the senior staff, uh, that have to run the bureaucracy to have those planning meetings that I talked about. And in fact, when I was in Washington about a month ago, two months ago, there were no people even in line for those jobs, no nominees, no list of people to fill those jobs. So, Let's go back. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Thank you, dear one, Ambassador <laughs> Dodokin. Uh, but this private life is too fun. <laughs> so anyway, so. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll find a way to plug in some, some people, thank you, uh, who care, who have, that was Ambassador Dorokin, by the way, who care, who have um, experience, who have vision, who can then pull along uh, the rest of the bureaucracy. Um, I'll leave it at that. I'll leave it at that because we're going to have some time for questions. Thank you.